Rapiger, Gavel. Hello, this is Kevin Katula. Hey, uh, this is working. Things sound louder. Wait a second. We're fine. It is. It is working. It doesn't sound like it's working. Doesn't sound like it's working. Jeez. He's getting back up there. Here. The lights on. Hey, this is Kevin Couture. I'm going to call the special town council meeting to order for the public hearing on the fiscal year 2023-2024 budget. It is time is 7:01. Uh, for purposes of roll call, Mr. Anderson is uh, coming. He may be late if he does make it, and Mr. Wood is absent with notification. And we will start the presentation to, uh, with the town manager giving a presentation on the town budget. And after she's done, we'll have the presentation from Mr. Angelini on the school board of education budget. And then we'll do questions on the town municipal budget first. And when those are done, then we'll do the board of education budget separate, secondly. At this time, I'll ask the town manager, Mary, to come up and take over. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. And for those that are online, thank you for watching. Um, I'm Mary Clorio, the town manager for the town of Killingly, and I'm just going to walk through um, summaries of the of the budget that's being presented um, and uh, some of the details around the uh, changes to the town's general government side of the budget. And then uh, Mr. A uh, Mr. Angeli is going to review the Board of Education budget proposal. So next slide. The first slide is um, just the historical view of our grand list. So this is um, one of the base values that we utilize in calculating what our mill rate is, thereby also calculating what your taxes are going to be. This is the accumulation of total property values between real estate, motor vehicle, and personal property. So this is the values, and you can see in the 23-24 year, the grand list has had um, a little bit of growth. And as you can see through the years, we have some growth. The two orange bars that you're seeing, those are related to revaluation years. So every five years, by state statute, we're required to do a revaluation. We're getting ready to go into that. Many of you probably got data mailers um, in preparation for that for this upcoming October. Those are revaluation years, which means they had to revalue all the property. And um, you can see some of the market changes. And that ties into our next slide. So if you can go to the next slide. Next slide is the mill rates. So again, those orange bars are related to the time, the years in which we had a revaluation. And typically what happens if you look at the two slides side by side, when the grand list in a revaluation goes up, the mill rate subsequently comes down. So you can see that correlation between the two slides. But this is the historical view of our mill rate with the proposed um, mill rate for the upcoming budget that we have pr currently proposed. So the last column here for 23-24 is a proposed mill rate. That is not final yet. Um, that The council still has to go through deliberations and annual, we'll go through annual town meeting and then the budget referendum. But you can see that historical view. The next slide is just a comparison slide. So this compares the major um, components of the budget. Um, from the current fiscal year to the proposed next year's budget. Um, so for the current, for the general government appropriations, so this is the general operations of the town. Um, there's a proposed increase of 367829 I have a further breakdown of that in a later slide to give you an understanding of what is driving that increase. Um, the next line is the student resource officer and the armed security, security officer program. There's an increase in that because the Board of Education activated the armed security officer program in the current year, so they're budgeting for it. They have that increase for the next year. That line is wholly reimbursed to the town through the Board of Education. The next line, the human services subsidy line, that has an increase of a over, little over 201000 Those are um, requests from outside agencies for town funding. The law, and you'll, I have a further breakdown of what the majority of that um, increase is at a later slide. Largely, the majority of that increase is a request by KB Ambulance for ambulance service. 
Um, lastly, the final general other government appropriations. There's an increase of um, just over 4.9 million here. The largest component of that is actual cap is, ca is capital investment, um, and we'll go through um, that is offset by the allocation of other revenue, Lake Road generating, um, just a little bit, a few lines down on this slide. So that comes to a total accumulated general fund appropriations. The next section really goes through the um, offsets to that, which is the revenue side of the equation that is reduced off of that total to develop what is remaining to be tax, what we have to raise in taxation. So the general government revenues, there's actually a decrease, and that is really largely due to two things. One, the, the WPCA, our wastewater um, authority, um, had debt issuance over the years. They reimbursed the general fund for that, those debt payments. One of the debt payments fell off. And so that reimbursement from the sewer fund has decreased. So it's a wash. There's no actual impact to the mill rate on that, but it, so it comes off the revenue and it comes off the expense side. The other decrease to that is uh, with the build of this school building that we're in, there was an agreement um, that with the, um, with Brooklyn, that when they place students into the high school, that they would also contribute towards the debt service on this building. Um, Brooklyn has indicated that there's going to be um, fewer students that will be coming into Killingly, and so that revenue has been reduced, and so that's another impact to that line item, is because there's going to be fewer Brooklyn students contributing to offset that debt, so that's a decrease in the revenue. Um, the other, two, the next line is showing that reimbursement, that direct reimbursement from the Board of Education for that um, student resource officer and armed security officer program that shows that direct revenue offset. Um, the next piece is the general government fund balance contribution, and this fund balance contribution is going to offset capital improvements that are proposed within the budget. So um, we've been doing in the current year, and we're looking to continue for next year, the town council had done um, uh, an investment in road renewal, and we're maintaining that same level of funding for the road renewal at two and a half million. Um, to begin to start trying bringing our, our roads into better conditions. The other capital contribution that we're looking to make out of fund balance is $500,000 to replace the library roof. The library roof does have current leaks in it. Um, it has reached the end of its useful life. And while we've been patching it, it's not going to be sustainable. So we need to replace that roof. The, you, the activation of fund balance means that that capital project with the library roof and with the roads don't, doesn't impact mill rate. It's coming out of fund balance and it's being expended on those capital projects. So it doesn't impact the mill rate. So on the town side of the budget, or on the general government side of the budget, I should say, that leaves a increase in operational costs to the mill rate at a little over $876,000, or 0.56 mills. A little over a half a mill is attributed to that. The next section is the Board of Education, and again, Mr. Angeli will go over the increase in that request of the 1.7 million. Um, the educational revenues are um, largely our education cost sharing grant that we receive from the state, but the decrease here is also being reflected with regards to the tuition that would have been um, that we would have received from incoming Brooklyn students, and Brooklyn again has indicated that they don't foresee as many students coming into the school system, so there's a reduction on their, on their revenue for that. So that comes to a bottom line increase of 1.95 mills um, for the proposed budget that's before you. Next slide. And this is just a pictorial um, representation of where the revenues are coming from in totality, so clearly the largest portion of our revenues um, to operate both the Board of Education as well as the town general government operations and covering the debt is 53%. Um, um, and then we have um, the education revenue, which again is largely the education cost sharing 
Um, that makes up 25% uh, of our overall revenue. There's an increase here in the lake road generating, um, and that is because we had the, um, the pilot did expire. We have done an independent appraisal, and we have placed that on our, um, on our grand list. Um, however, that, that um, up assessment is under appeal, and so um, we have had to place reserves around that, but um, we, we have factored that in, and that's largely where that increase in capital expenditure is being funded through. Um, the other components are um, the various revenues that the town receives for licenses or permits or, you know, having to, or investment income, you know, those transactional components that we uh, collect funding on. And then the 4% is the use of fund balance, and we have an additional 3% that's in other state grants that we receive. Next slide. Overall expenditures, again, this is just the higher picture of overall expenditures. Debt service this uh, time around has increased, so we are in the process right now of getting ready to issue our first round of debt for the new capital projects for the KMS renovation project and for the Westfield Avenue project. This, uh, cap this debt issuance, um, as we were going through the approval process of both of those projects, we had indicated that the fiscal year 2024 would be the first year that we would have to begin payments on debt issuances for those projects. We're in the process of issuing $7 million in bonds for those projects. And so this will be the first year that we have a debt, uh, the, the debt service for that. So that has increased our debt service payment by payments by almost $400,000. Um, the other components um, in general is the town operations, but clearly the largest piece of that piece of this pie is the Board of Education expenses. Next slide. The next slide really just speaks to just the town operations um, and just the pictorial view of how the various how the various larger components are broken down within the general government. So when you look at the general government uh, piece at 17%, that is really most of the town hall functions like town clerk, planning and development, uh, not planning and development, um, uh, sorry, town clerk, um, town manager's office, finance department, assessor's department, revenue department, all of those various departments combined together. That's the vast majority of those. Um, economic development is in there. The next, the largest group is the public works, and so this is the highway department. It also is the maintenance of all of our, of all of our fleet and all of our equipment, as well as all fuel um, for all and all of the entities, um, winter maintenance, um, and that. Um, recreation and cultural, that is the recreation department, parks department, library department. They're at 11 percent. Um, public health, safety, and community development. This is our um, our building department and fire marshal department, as well as um, community development and our law enforcement. Um, and I did break out the A R the SRO and the ASR pro ASO program separately, so you could see that shared service between both the board of education and the town. Um, and then the human services subsidy, again, those are outside agencies that have requested funds of the town. That's 6%. Employee benefits and insurance. This is employee benefits, so think health insurance, payroll taxes, pension, as well as our property, liability, and workers' comp insurance. So this is all of those components tied together at 19%. And then the special reserves, which are um, reserve, Killingly has a long, um, a long practice of um, setting aside um, funding for future and for long-term goals and for long-term reserves. Um, that's 3% uh, of the overall budget. So to go into a bit more detail for what has changed within town operations, We've had contractual wage increases. We do have uh, three unions, so we do have contractual wage increases. We have had impacts from minimum wage. Um, we do have a uh, recreation and library are two departments that are directly impacted by that shift in minimum wage. And we have had um, turnover in staff in which we've had to hire new staff coming in and market rate for those positions has definitely increased and impacted the budget. 
Um, the next grouping is employee benefits. We did have an increase in our health insurance of 6% that is reflected within this budget. And then there was some increases to um, our reserves. So the contingency um, line, and this is really to manage those unexpected things. And an example of that would be um, last year, uh, last year we ended up having to close the community center for a period of time because we had a hot water heater failure as well as we had, um, we had squirrels playing Macbeth on the, on the stage, right? And so we needed to hire a pest control company to come in. We had to do some tree work, all of that. Those are all things that we wouldn't necessarily budget for because you're not budget, you don't, we don't budget for catastrophic, but that's what the contingency account was for, is to handle those unexpected failures that occur. Um, so we're not having to look at requesting a supplemental appropriation that can really be detrimental when we go to look at um, going to issue, issue our debt and bonds and going for a credit rating. So just like all of us personally have credit rate, you know, a credit rating, and when you go to borrow money, that credit rating is incredibly important to determine how much you're going to pay in interest. The same impact is for the town, and so our, we're getting ready to go into that. Um, credit rating with our credit rating agency, and they definitely scrutinize or um, um, have a negative view of when a town issue does supplemental appropriation. So that's what the contingency account helps to buffer. Um, lastly, under human services, that was a separate line. Um, KB Ambulance has requested an additional 145,000 um, on their on their. Um, uh, subsidy request. Northeast District Department of Health um, had an increase in their request um, and this and then we had there's a whole number of various other agencies if you look at um, the Department 52 within the budget it lists all all of the agencies all the rest of them combined is another 25,000 um, and largely due to per capita per capita increases or just general operational increases for those entities. So what does this mean for our taxpayers? Um, so this I did as a representation. So just to give an understanding of what this might mean. So if you have a property value, a house that is valued on your property card for at the assessor's office at $200,000, it's assessed at 70% of that. So you're taxed on 70% of that value. So that gives you a a taxable value of $140,000. So this 1.95 mill rate increase means an annual tax dollar increase of $273. So that's how, I'm not gonna go through every single scenario, you guys can read the slide. So that's how each of these buckets are determined. And what I did was, there's a link here to the assessor's page for the tax calculator. I recommend everybody, if, you, um, if anybody has any questions about what is my property valued at, um, we've had a lot of property transactions that have occurred in the last few, in the last couple of years. Know that our valuation on your property, unless you did any major renovation or expansion or improvement to your property, all of them are based on property values from five years ago, right? So, you know, you may have just bought your house in the last year or so. You really should look up what's on the property card because it's probably not the same as what you paid for in your real estate transaction because that's, again, based on a market value from, you know, five years ago. So look that up. It, you can find that information right online. You can go to the assessor's page, click on property cards, look up your address, and you can pull your property card up right online and you can see what they have as the gross assessment or the gross value and then the net assessment or the taxable value. So that way you can understand what it is. But a lot of us have a pretty good understanding of what we think what our property value is, and this is just kind of give you an idea of what their bu what those buckets might look like and what that annual um, impact would be. So um, for those that have escrows, you would take this number and divide it by 12 in order to be able to um, see what your monthly impact, you know, everybody wants to know what's my mortgage payment going to get impacted by. 
take that and divide it by 12, and that would give you what your monthly mortgage payment impact would, would likely be. So again, I encourage everyone to kind of look up those components individually, and again, if anybody has any questions about that or they're unsure of where to find that on the website, feel free, please call the town hall. We'll walk, we'll walk everybody through it on, you know, over the phone, um, and we're glad to help with that. Um, that concludes my portion. I will turn it over to Mr. Angeli for his presentation. Thank you, Ms. Glorio. Uh, I'm Bob Angeli, superintendent for the Killingly Public Schools, and I'm pleased to be here representing the Board of Education uh, and presenting uh, their approved budget, which uh, has an increase of 3.9% uh, over the current year education budget. Uh, from the Board of Education tonight, we have uh, Mr. Farron, the board chair, uh, Ms. Martin, the vice chair, and then working uh, your way down the table towards me is uh, Ms. Uh, Rivera Abrams, Ms. Domkowski, Mr. Uh, Naparada, Ms. Hedges, thank you for leaning forward, <laughs> and um, Ms. Landon. Okay, so uh, first slide, thank you. So the first slide is uh, just the timeline of uh, the budget development for the Board of Education. Uh, we start the process uh, almost a year in advance um, in October and November with the principals working with their school uh, staff on uh, what is needed at each of the schools and then the department uh, leadership of our district departments also works with uh, their staff on uh, what, it, what they are projecting as the needs for the following school year. And then uh, as you can see, we uh, move through a series of uh, meetings uh, that occur um, I present a preliminary budget uh, to the Board of Education at the end of January. Uh, the board then convenes as a committee of the whole uh, and holds a series of budget workshops. Uh, and then um, a superintendent's budget is uh, presented to the Board of Education at its first meeting in March. Uh, the board uh, acts on that budget by either approving it, increasing it, or decreasing the request. Uh, and then we submit that uh, budget to the town. Uh, then we make a presentation to the town council. Uh, you can see we did that on Saturday, April 1st. And then the highlighted meeting is the one that we're at today. We're at the public hearing. Uh, and then following this, uh, there will be a town meeting uh, and a budget referendum. Thank you. So the, board, uh, the board's budget is built on uh, several goals. So when we uh, develop the budget, we need to make sure that we are budgeting in support of the goals. Uh, the board has uh, four goals. The first goal is around academic achievement. Uh, the second goal is around talent development, right? So uh, providing professional development for our staff, recruiting good people, and then uh, retaining them. The third goal is around organizational uh, systems. So uh, this is around providing safe, healthy, uh, adaptable uh, learning environment for our students and a, a work environment for our staff. Um, and it's uh, also to make sure that we are providing uh, current technologies for our students and staff uh, to enhance their uh, learning and uh, teaching opportunities. And organizational systems also is around uh, creating uh, efficiencies in how uh, we do business. And then uh, the final goal on school culture and climate are uh, really goals around uh, making the work environment a positive one, uh, safe and accepting uh, for all of our students and uh, all of our staff. 
This document, the profile of a graduate, uh, was uh, developed, and it must be uh, four or five years ago now at this point, uh, but I could tell you it is very much a living document within uh, the Killingly Public Schools. It is one that is uh, frequently referenced uh, when we are uh, discussing adding um, new programs to the school system, adding uh, new positions to our school system, uh, looking for uh, specific professional development opportunities for our staff. Uh, it is a document that uh, is used uh, often uh, in the school system, and it is one that is um, always being looked at to see whether or not it remains current with uh, what we are trying to do as an organization for our students and staff. So we have all the Board of Ed goals. We have the profile of the graduate, um, but we also need to uh, remain efficient and fiscally responsible, right? So those are the two competing uh, aspects of uh, building an educational budget, uh, same as uh, with the town budget, right? The town has goals but wants to be fiscally responsible. The Board of Education strives uh, to do the same. So ways that we have to control uh, the budget Right, so we look at it uh, two uh, different ways. Um, so school systems sometimes uh, have the reputation of just adding and adding and adding to the budget without really uh, reviewing and evaluating uh, current programs. Uh, but we are trying to do uh, both. We're, we are trying to add things that we feel are gonna help the district move forward uh, but we also realize that we must uh, occasionally take time to review uh, current programs to see if there is anything um, that we uh, could perhaps uh, do in a different way or uh, a cut from our program. So uh, what, the, what you'll see in this budget proposal is that we do have some position uh, and program cuts. Um, we also uh, have to deal with uh, current uh, inflation rate. Uh, so the uh, U.S. Uh, inflation rate was 6.4 when I uh, put this uh, presentation together. Uh, got a few weeks now, so I'm not sure if that is the current uh, number. But as you know, uh, coming out of uh, the COVID pandemic, inflation hit uh, like astronomical levels. Uh, it has since come down a little bit, but a 6.4% uh, inflation rate is uh, still a very high rate. Uh, some of the uh, aspects of that for the school system has been uh, uh, fuel costs, uh, maintenance supplies. Uh, that's just a couple of different ones. Uh, we did find out after the presentation uh, was uh, developed for the town council meeting that the town has successfully negotiated uh, for our fuel, and so the uh, increase there is going to be minimal, uh, but uh, initially we had uh, anticipated a, a higher cost there, and one of the things that we experienced this year and we're a little uh, concerned about for next year is uh, we've had to purchase heating oil for our schools uh, this year that we thought were going to be transitioned to natural gas. So the high school and Killingly Central School uh, were supposed to have been uh, transitioned over to natural gas for the current school year. That project has been delayed a number of times for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so uh, we had not budgeted for fuel oil and so we had to purchase uh, fuel oil this year. Uh, if, we're, if we end up having to do that again for next school year, um, that would be an unanticipated uh, cost in our budget. So right now, uh, we're hopeful that we'll have the uh, transition to natural gas projects at those two schools completed in time uh, for the start of the next school year. And then the other way we control uh, the budget is to find alternative uh, funding so sources. Uh, so these uh, most often are grants uh, that we uh, apply for um, 
and uh, receive uh, either directly from the state or uh, from the federal governments. Um, one of the things though about grants is uh, that they time out and so things that are in the grants, uh, you either lose them or you have to move them over to the general budget uh, if there is no other uh, alternative funding source uh, for that item. Uh, and then also for staff that you have in uh, those grants as uh, contract salaries go up, that doesn't mean our grants will automatically go up either. So if the grants stay flat as they have uh, in previous years, then things that are in the grants uh, staff-wise uh, need to come out of the grant and move into the operating budget. Next slide, please. So for uh, the Board of Education 23-24 uh, budget, um, my proposed budget to the board on March 8th was a 5.3% increase. Uh, that is uh, right in the neighborhood of where a lot of superintendent uh, budget increases are coming in this year. Uh, and that is largely due to, to inflationary uh, aspects. Uh, a lot of school systems have been increasing the salaries and benefits that they uh, provide to their employees in order to attract uh, employees to their districts. Uh, as you know, the um, uh, employment uh, situation in a lot of different industries. Uh, there are just not a lot of people uh, applying for the vacancies that are out there. If you go, if you've ever been uh, out uh, to the restaurants uh, right after the pandemic and, and currently, you know that staffing in restaurants is down. You know that staffing, uh, when you read the newspapers for uh, trucking and transportation, our way down, and so uh, the same is true for uh, the educational industry, teachers, paraprofessionals, and other people that work within the school systems. Uh, there are not a lot of people uh, applying for the jobs that we have uh, available. The Board of Education on March 8th um, reduced that request down to a 3.94% increase. Uh, so that is $1,775,319 over the current year budget uh, for a total of $46,805,118. So that is uh, currently the board's approved uh, budget. So uh, how did we get from the superintendent's uh, uh, budget from the uh, preliminary budget. So uh, you may recall I said I present a preliminary budget to the board uh, towards the end of January. That is the budget that is uh, sent to me uh, by the building level uh, principals and district level administrators from the work that they did with their uh, staffs uh, during those October and November meetings then they came and met with uh, myself, with Ms. Clark, our manager of business affairs, uh, with uh, Dr. Nash, our assistant superintendent, um, and pre they presented their requests. Their requests to the uh, general budget uh, came in at 8.05%, and then they had additional new things that they wanted to add to uh, the budget. Those we call decision packages, oftentimes uh, they're requests for additional staff. Uh, that's uh, primarily uh, what we get in those decision packages. Occasionally there will be requests for uh, new vehicles, uh, like a truck for our operations and maintenance, or it could be a van for our transportation department. Uh, this year we didn't have any requests uh, for new vehicles. So all told, that was a 12.11% increase over the current year budget, right? And so that we knew was not going to be uh, an appropriate request, right? That is not uh, a respectful uh, request for the town. And so we knew we were gonna have to reduce it down. So we made some 
uh, changes to the budget. So there were some budget adjustments. Uh, we also uh, are anticipating that we will end the year uh, with a budget surplus this year. Um, so some people think that, you know, that could be a good thing, uh, but in uh, actuality, it, it just is a, a result of our being understaffed all year long. So when you cannot hire staff, the money that you have in your budget for salaries, benefits, et cetera, uh, goes unspent. And that is where most of our uh, budget surplus uh, will be. Uh, so we are proposing that we will use uh, 601,000, uh, just a little bit over that, to do some spending this spring and get some things and put them in place uh, this school year uh, instead of waiting for next school year. And then uh, with the decision packages, uh, we reduced uh, the decision packages uh, down. Um, and so the total reductions uh, equal the 6.81%. And so the superintendent's budget, my budget came in at 5.3. So there's already been a significant reduction to the request that was initially made uh, down to a 5.3. I brought that to the board, um, and then the board further reduced it, and I'll tell you what uh, we did to get down to 3.94. But I wanted you to know, I, I told you that we were looking at, uh, you know, should there be things that uh, should be cut out of the budget, and can we find alternative funding sources for some of the things that we wanted to put in the budget? So there are some things that we moved uh, into grants, and because of the rules around some of the grants that were provided to uh, municipalities and school systems, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, these are primarily the ESSER grants that you may uh, have heard about or read about. Um, we there is uh, no rule about supplanting. So generally, you can't take something that you're already paying for uh, in your general budget and move it into a grant because that's called supplanting. But with the ESSER grants, uh, the supplanting rule uh, had not been established. And so uh, we were able to move some things uh, that we had in our budget into the grants. That means anything that we already had into the, in the grant, we lost. Right? So there are some things that we felt were uh, a higher priority than than things that were, that were already in the grant. And so we eliminated those things out of the grants and moved things from the general operating budget into the grant. So that equaled uh, $444,024, and you could see uh, the items that we moved on the screen. Uh, and then we uh, generally, we do have uh, some retirements every year. Uh, and when we have those, uh, we uh, normally we'll have some savings because we will hire someone at a lower step on the salary uh, scale. Uh, and so we anticipate some um, savings there. And then uh, there were some reductions that uh, we did make. So a little over $400,000 in uh, reductions. Um, we eliminated uh, 16, it doesn't say 16 here, but that's the number, eliminated 16 part-time paraprofessional positions. These are positions that we have been unable to fill um, for about three years, right, since the, the pandemic. Uh, paraprofessionals has been one of the areas that our school system and other school systems have struggled in filling those positions, especially uh, the part-time positions. So um, we're gonna eliminate those positions. Uh, we're going to uh, reduce uh, the amount of paper uh, that we purchase. And this is primarily because we have made uh, purchases of paper during the pandemic. Uh, and then uh, of course we didn't use as much paper during the pandemic and so we have a supply of paper that's going to allow us to reduce the purchase. Uh, uh, we are uh, reducing uh, the field trip line uh, for our Goodyear Early Childhood Center. Uh, you may know that um, that is a uh, revenue generating program. 
uh, for uh, the district. Uh, we will uh, use those revenues to field, uh, to pay for those uh, field trips. Uh, we are reducing a uh, IT lease. So one of the ways the district tries to control the cost of all the devices that we purchase, computer devices, uh, these could be laptops or Chromebooks or desktops, uh, iPads, et cetera. Uh, every, you know, so one, you have to buy new, and then uh, occasionally uh, on a cycle of every four to five years, you, you need to do a refresh, right? Because the, uh, the devices uh, age out and uh, they become no longer supportable. So uh, that's a... That's a, a big expense in the educational budget, and so the way you control that so it is not a huge jump in one year over a next year is you purchase over time on a, on a lease program. And so the district normally has four to five different IT leases uh, in play on any given year. Some of them will be in the last year of a four or five year lease, and some of them are would be in a two-year or three-year state, right? And then whatever uh, new ones we put in there, and that keeps IT relatively level from year to year, so it doesn't create a huge budget uh, impact uh, in the following years. But uh, we have re uh, reduced uh, uh, some of our uh, IT lease uh, in this grant, and uh, we found that uh, when we move to illustrative math, uh, for some of our um, elementary students. Um, we had uh, budgeted uh, in two different uh, locations for our intermediate school. Um, so we had that in the operating budget and we had it uh, in a grant. So we just took it out of the operating budget, right? You, we don't want to uh, double budget for items. And so those reductions, uh, $914,782, right? That's a 2.03% reduction, right, to get down to the uh, five. Next slide, please. And then, uh, like I said, uh, we uh, plan to spend around $600,000 uh, this spring to buy things now uh, instead of waiting for next year. Uh, you can see that uh, that includes supplies across uh, various uh, departments and schools, uh, textbooks, uh, and then uh, equipment slash property. Uh, so that could be instructional equipment or it could be uh, like maintenance equipment, et cetera. Next uh, slide, please. So the decision packages, uh, you'll remember uh, there was um, a large uh, amount uh, in terms of money and percentage in uh, new things that people brought forward for consideration to have in this budget. We uh, winnowed that down to these items that you see on this slide. Uh, we are looking to add a psychologist uh, for the school uh, district. Uh, this district has uh, just one school psychologist since uh, I think 2017, uh, whereas in the past it had two, uh, and the district has uh, struggled to fill that position uh, since it was vacated in 2017, uh, but we feel it's an important position to have for the district. Uh, I can tell you that uh, some districts have a school psych uh, at every single one of their schools, like one per school. Uh, we're trying to have uh, just two for the district. Uh, we are um, adding uh, a staff member to our business office. Uh, that basically will increase our uh, efficiency and ability uh, to navigate uh, a variety of different uh, business issues that we have uh, in the district. One of them is uh, managing all the grants. Uh, another is managing all the uh, various projects that we have to fund for uh, capital improvements, uh, the high turnover rate uh, that we've experienced with staff uh, creates uh, stresses and burdens on the business office. And so uh, we feel we need uh, an extra per person there. 
It says business office assistant, uh, but it really is more like an assistant business uh, manager position. At the high school, uh, we are looking to increase uh, staff in our family consumer science. Uh, that would uh, be a 0.55 uh, increase. We already have a part-time person uh, working at the high school. This would increase that position to full-time, uh, and that would meet uh, uh, enrollment uh, requests from our students. Uh, for uh, courses in that area and also uh, allow us to provide uh, additional courses in early childhood uh, development. Uh, ESCON, uh, which is the Regional Educational Resource Center, uh, has a Head Start pre-K program here at our high school and it's in a room uh, where on one side is the Head Start program, on the other side uh, it would be the classroom for our early childhood uh, classes, and it has a one-way mirror so the students, right, open the drapes and they could uh, view uh, the pre-K students in the Head Start program kind of like a, an uh, observational lab for them, and then they also uh, get to go into that classroom and interact with the students. And then uh, for our operations and maintenance, uh, we're looking uh, to add a uh, part-time uh, Goodyear custodian. Uh, we currently have a part-time custodian at the Goodyear program, but that person is not in the school uh, during the entire school day. Uh, that person comes in uh, late in the morning and then stays through the end of the day. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, a building full of uh, pre-K age students, great, you know, mostly ages uh, three, four, and five, right? Um, little kids don't wait to uh, make a mess or ha have an accident until the custodian gets there. So uh, we really feel it's uh, necessary to have a custodian there all day. So the total increases. Uh, for the decision packages, $278,252. That's an overall increase of uh, 0.62 uh, to the budget. So this is just a, a running history uh, dating back to uh, the 15-16 school year through uh, the request that's being made for the 23-24 school year. Uh, you'll see that I came in at 5.3%. Uh, uh, that is uh, the third highest request uh, during this span of time. Uh, the Board of Ed ab adopted a budget of 3.94%. Uh, that is also the third highest uh, in this uh, time span. Both of those percents are in alignment with uh, what we're seeing uh, across the state of Connecticut in terms of uh, education budgets. And then, of course, the adopted budget uh, is to be uh, determined. That will be determined at a uh, town referendum. So uh, this is a, a very generalized um, presentation of uh, where the budget uh, is increasing. So uh, the salary line in the budget, uh, you'll see uh, there is an increase of $445,416. Uh, to that, to the salary line items, that's a 1.61% increase to, the, uh, to that line item. The overall increase to the budget is 0.99%. Uh, Benefits for uh, the employees, uh, is, uh, would go up by $81,954. That's a 1.17% increase to that line item. Uh, the overall impact to the budget, 0.18%. Uh, uh, Purchase services, this uh, goes across uh, several different uh, object codes, but purchase services is basically us uh, hiring other people or hiring other agencies, right? And so uh, it's paying their salaries and it's paying their benefits uh, to do work uh, for the district in a variety of uh, different areas. 
You can see that uh, the projection there is uh, going up $716,558. That's a 7.42% increase in, that, in those line items. The overall budget increase is 1.59%. Uh, uh, if you've uh, engaged in contracting for any kind of uh, service, construction service, uh, legal services, uh, waste management services, or anything uh, that you're, uh, you, you're doing at your home where you have to contract out for services, uh, you know the costs involved in those services uh, has uh, gone up tremendously. Um, those three items, if you take the salaries and the benefits alone, Overall, for, for the whole budget, they, uh, they are 75% of the budget uh, goes into salaries and benefits uh, for the district uh, employees, right? And that is uh, a common uh, number. Uh, I've seen it as high as 80, uh, and sometimes it uh, dips down into the 60s, uh, but most districts uh, you have somewhere in the 70% uh, area. So we're, uh, that's 75% for us. If you add in purchase services, right, which is paying other people's salaries and benefits, right, for the services that they provide, that percentage of the overall uh, budget for the school system goes up to 97%. Everything else in the budget is 3% of the overall budget. So it, uh, our budget, an educational budget, is uh, very much uh, tied to the people uh, that work in the school system and those people that we contract out, right? And uh, in the end, uh, they all provide supports or direct programming for our students. For the supplies, uh, the increase there, uh, 162,791, you'll see that that's a overall increase to the budget of uh, less than 1%, less than a half a percent, 0.36. Uh, the property that we're buying, and again, uh, the property is uh, basically uh, either educational or non-educational uh, equipment, right? It could be uh, stethoscopes for the nurses, it could be uh, new chainsaws for uh, O&M, right? So a lot of different things would fit in that uh, equipment line. Uh, the overall impact there is uh, negligible to the overall budget, 0.12%. Uh, um, on, in the other line, uh, this, is, um, this is how we uh, meet contractual obligations for tuition reimbursement for uh, some of our staff that are uh, continuing their education. We also meet contractual obligations for uh, staff members that have um, clothing allowances, uh, O&M, transportation, uh, come quickly to mind um, for that. And then, uh, you know, there are times when uh, the school system has uh, celebrations, open houses, uh, things like that, and so those are uh, also funded uh, through the other line. 900 uh, contingency usually is a line item that we just have at zero. We don't generally budget for contingency. Uh, but what you see here is um, uh, we received a 0% uh, a increase for the current school year. Um, but what we did is uh, we took a gamble and said if we continue to have the difficulty in staffing our vacancies, um, we still may end up with a surplus uh, at the end of the year with a 0% increase, right? And um, unfortunately, we have had uh, staffing difficulties and we will end up with a surplus. But the board uh, agreed to uh, build in a safety net uh, just in case uh, we were able to staff at normal uh, levels for the current school year. Uh, had that happened, we would be operating uh, in the red, but the board uh, agreed to use the non, we have a non-lapsing account where surplus money from a school year can be uh, 
uh, deposited into a non-lapsing account with the town council's uh, permission, and then the uh, education system uh, can use that for to offset educational expenses uh, that either are unanticipated or unbudgeted, right? And so we did not uh, eliminate any uh, positions or programs uh, last year when we went from a 2% increase and received the 0%. What we did was uh, we built in a, the safety net with a non-lapsing account. Uh, and so we have to put that money back into the budget for next year. And so that's why you see a negative 275, 671 in the current year column. Uh, next year, you see a zero, so we, we're adding 275,671, which is an overall increase of 0.61 uh, to the budget, and that's where we end up uh, totaling all those to 3.94% for the Board of Ed's approved budget. So uh, why the increase, right? So I've uh, just given you some uh, examples of that, but salaries and benefits, overall uh, impact 0.55%. Uh, we added armed security uh, guards for our schools. Uh, the Board of Education and I uh, feel that this is an important safety measure uh, for the schools. There could be some deterrent value to having an armed security guard at your school, uh, but even if there, there isn't a deterrent value, uh, having somebody there uh, should decrease response time uh, should a, a horrific incident occur within our schools. Uh, we already had a school resource officer primarily working at the high school and the intermediate school and then occasionally out to our elementary schools but adding uh, the armed security guards, one for each of the uh, schools, uh, will help us uh, have a greater uh, security uh, presence within the schools. Uh, so that was 0.93% uh, uh, increase to the budget. Our, again, uh, the decision package is 0.62, contingency 0.61, everything else uh, 1.23, so again, uh, 3.94% increase to the education uh, budget. Uh, and about the armed security, uh, so it says armed security guards, it really should say armed security officers, uh, ASOs. Um, we are in partnership with the town on that. They're not uh, district employees. They are employed by the town through the uh, police department. Uh, they are not police officers, but they are all uh, going to be retired, uh, either state troopers or municipal police officers, uh, once we are full staff. Currently, we have two uh, in place, one here at the high school and one at KISS Intermediate School. So other changes that we made to get down to 3.94%, uh, there is a reduction of uh, seven certified staff positions uh, this year to next year. There is a reduction of two non-certified staff positions. Uh, and so the total uh, staff reductions is a 1.36% uh, uh, decrease to get back uh, down to that 3.94. And then... Um, Revenue projections, you already heard from uh, Ms. Calorio. Uh, the school system uh, is a revenue generator for uh, the municipality, uh, for the town of Killingly. Uh, that uh, comes primarily through uh, state and federal grants, uh, mostly the uh, ECS grant, which is Educational Cost Share, uh, also called the Equalization Grant. Uh, so you'll hear it referred to uh, both ways in uh, state uh, documents. Um, but we also generate tuitions for uh, students that uh, come to the district on a tuition paying basis. That could be here at the high school in the ag program. Uh, we do have 
uh, agreements with uh, Brooklyn and Pomfret that we are a designated high school for their students. And so when they send us their students, they pay us uh, tuition to receive uh, their students. Occasionally we do get uh, tuition paying students uh, at some of the other schools, but that is uh, more uh, rare, right? It's less, less frequent. Uh, most of that occurs here at the high school. Uh, but anyway, uh, Ms. Calorio let you know uh, that we are expecting a reduction uh, in revenues, uh, in particular uh, from uh, some tuitions, right? So we have heard from other superintendents uh, their projected numbers of the students they will be sending uh, to us, um, and th that number, uh, those numbers are down compared to uh, what we have this year. The next slide is uh, me trying to fit all the various grants uh, all on one slide, so uh, if if it's hard to read up on the slide, hopefully you uh, picked up a paper copy on your way in. But these are uh, the title grants and other uh, grants that we get either from the state or uh, from the federal government that provides um, uh, funding for the school system. Uh, so there are four different uh, title grants. Uh, because we're an alliance district, we, <coughs> excuse me, we're an alliance district, we do receive some funding uh, for that. Uh, we get funding for our Family Resource Center, which is located at the Goodyear School. Uh, we do get a small grant for primary mental health. Uh, that uh, used to be called uh, the Pixie Grant, and uh, we still have a Pixie uh, program in the school system. All right, uh, just to uh, pick out a couple more, the uh, Carl uh, D. Perkins grant we use at the high school that uh, supports career uh, and work education uh, at the high school. Uh, the Essers, uh, they uh, are being used uh, in a variety of different ways for staff, for supplies, uh, for programming, for facilities. So we're using the uh, Essers in lots of different ways. Uh, and the IDEA grants, uh, primarily offset costs uh, for special education uh, programming, uh, and we use a good portion uh, to pay for uh, many of our paraprofessionals. Uh, so uh, there's always unknowns uh, in the budget development process. Uh, I've always felt like the budget development process is a little backwards. It would be helpful what, uh, if we knew what the state budget was. Uh, and then uh, the town uh, budget and the Board of Ed budget uh, could be developed knowing what the, town, uh, what the state uh, has in mind, uh, but it goes uh, opposite, right? So the Board of Ed uh, adopts a budget, then the town gets a budget passed, and then the state uh, will get a budget. So it goes uh, a little bit uh, backwards. Um, so the, the status of the state and federal grants, uh, that's always in flux. We usually don't get that information until well after the budget season. Um, the, the pension, when we built our budget, uh, the pension amount was an estimated amount for uh, some of our employees. Out of district placements, that's uh, special education placements. Uh, that is something that's uh, always in flux, it changes uh, on an annual basis, and sometimes it changes uh, day to day, um, whether or not students move in or out of the district, or there is a change in a student's program that already uh, is a student in our district. Uh, fuel and utilities, we spoke a little bit about that. Uh, and I have the decision packages here as a budget unknown, uh, because I don't know what the uh, final uh, budget uh, will be that is awarded and uh, if it is not um, you know 3.94 it becomes something uh, lower than that uh, you know the things that we have preliminarily identified as potential cuts those seven certified staff pitch positions to non-certified staff positions uh, we will revisit all of that uh, once we know what the total cut is uh, that we're going to have to make uh, so, uh, next slide. So just as a reminder, 
the current uh, budget uh, approved by the Board of Education is $46,805,118. That's an increase of $1,775,319, or an increase of 3.94%. Uh, the next couple of slides are just uh, some enrollment uh, history uh, for the district. Uh, and you could see uh, on the bottom of this slide that over the last few years, uh, we are seeing an increase in student uh, enrollment in the district. These are uh, based on the October numbers uh, that we report to the state. And then uh, at the elementary level that uh, is on the next slide, uh, you could see some of uh, the breakout for uh, the memorial school and the central school regarding uh, specific class sizes. Okay, and that would uh, conclude my presentation. And Ms. Clario for her presentations on the budget. I'll open the floor first for comments directly to the uh, town municipal budget. And after we conclude with those, we'll open the floor for comments on the Board of Education budget and the emailed comments that we received. So anyone wishing to come up to make a comment to the podium or to the microphone there for a townwide budget, come up and please state your name and address. Kevin Perry, 172 Mash Sucker Road. Danielson, um, I'm just, I'd be kind of embarrassed a 30% increase in this economy. I mean, with all, prices of everything going up, I think we should dig more into it. I mean, I, I, I did a budget at work at Walmart. I was a store manager at Walmart for $116 million. We made $8 million at the end of the year. It's tough to do, but we got veterans, we got people, uh, uh, handicapped, disabled, and uh, to propose a budget for 30%, I, I don't understand. <laughs> Somebody's not doing their job, that's all I got. Uh, yeah, Ian McDonald, uh, 548 Valley Road. Um, this is maybe a little bit forward looking, but just mention, I, I know there's a situation over at uh, Edie Prey Reservoir and that's being dealt with over off of Quinns Hill Road and East Killingly with uh, the breach of that particular pond. Uh, I also know that, that uh, the company uh, Wish um, Investment Company that has the rights to the ponds has, has come in the past and sort of, uh, sort of threatened to breach uh, the various ponds in the area. I just want to mention from a, um, I mean that, that ED Prey does get used and, but I understand that's a particular situation. But in terms of the other ponds, you know, from a budgetary perspective, there's a lot of economic development around them. You know, you have a large camp, uh, campground, hideaway, I think it's hideaway, uh, off of Middle Reservoir and across the, across the way, uh, State Line Campground. Those are probably two of the biggest um, uh, businesses in East Killingly, and, and there's a lot of people coming into town and buying things in our town uh, who attend those, and if these ponds are drained, that's not going to be a great thing <laughs> from a budgetary perspective. Um, you know, also, I don't know that this, how much this impacts our budget, but I know the Kiln, East Killingly Fire Department relies on those for fire management as well. And just more generally, uh, those, um, you know, those ponds are very much valued uh, for recreation, uh, fishing, and, and when this was proposed earlier, as some of you might remember, there was the... Um, auditorium at the old junior high uh, on Broad Street was, was packed to the gills. I think it was like 250 people were pretty mad about this threat. So hopefully this is stopping with the ED Prey. I know that's a unique situation, but I just say like going forward, um, sometimes I know people just don't want to deal with this stuff, but this could be a pretty negative budgetary and other impact on the town. So just I, I hope that does that stops with that particular reservoir. Thank you. Yeah, I-N-M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Echoing, yeah, it's kind of... Oh, it's hard to see. You can't see anything. 
Thank you. If you can, if you could just leave a little distance between you and the microphone, it might not echo as much and be a little clearer to understand. We'll try. Thank you. <laughs> Michael Hugo, 20 John Street, Downson. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the town count, the town manager, and everybody else for their hard work in this creating this budget. It's not an easy task. I have created many budgets in my years, and it's quite hard to do. Uh, one of the, you know, you can see there was a good slide on which items are getting the most money on the incoming as far as the town, uh, the town, man, the town operation part. The biggest one being KB Ambulance, and if I remember right, when I was listening in, when they made their presentation, is they want to add a second ambulance to the town of Kilnley. I've been on both sides of, as a first responder and as a patient, and recently even my wife as a patient, waiting for an ambulance. This is years ago, but waiting for an ambulance, that's not a good sign. If, you know, so to sit there and wait and tell the patients an ambulance is coming, an ambulance is coming, it's not an easy task. But there was one item that I wish KB had better figures on, and that is the mutual aid. How much did KB Ambulance have to call or did the town of Kinley have to call for mutual aid to receive mutual aid from surrounding areas because there was no ambulance available? And how much, if we're paying for an extra ambulance, if that has to be called out on mutual aid, how many times does KB give mutual aid to the surrounding areas? It's a tough question because, again, you go back I was the patient sitting there saying, where's my ambulance? It's not, it, five minutes seems like three hours. So it's a tough, tough question. Thank you. Anyone else for a public comment on the municipal budget? Last call. All right, seeing no one come up, we'll move on to the Board of Education budget presentation, uh, public comments. Uh, before we open the floor, I know we've had several emailed letters for public comment that we'd like to put, put in the record. Uh, uh, yeah, let's do the public the email ones first. Okay, so for um, emailed public comments, what I will be doing is stating the name, um, address of the person if they provided it, and just um, a, a brief um, summary. We don't read fully into the record, fully all of the public comments, but the comments, all of the written public comments are on the town's website, and they've also been provided to the secretary, and all of the council members have received them. So <clears throat> they have them in full detail. Um, and I will apologize now if I mispronounce anyone's names. There's a lot of them here. So um, the first one is from Ernest Dodge. He is the Latin teacher for the high school. And he wrote, uh, he submitted a public comment in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Susan Griffiths, 70 Griffiths Road in Killingly. She wrote a public comment in support of the world language program. The next one is Kim Waynot from 83 Perry Street, Unit 174 in Putnam. She wrote a public comment in support of maintaining the Latin program at the high school. The next one is Chloe Crossman, 340 Christian Hill Road, Brooklyn, Connecticut, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program at the high school. The next one is Rebecca Snay, 23 Strawberry Street in Elizabeth, Connecticut, wrote public comment in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Penny Crosteris of Burlingame, California, and she wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Dax Rich, 
of Fort Worth, Texas, and he wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Andrew Waynach of 83 Perry Street, Unit 173, Putnam, Connecticut, and he wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Uh, the next one is Kimberly Fitzpatrick Lewis of 15 Marshall Drive, Enfield, and she wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Amanda Gilbert, uh, 32 Crawford Drive in Manchester, Connecticut, and she wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Christopher Paul of 76 Peekaboo Street in Danielson, and that is, and he wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Irene Rose of uh, Denham Springs, Louisiana, and she wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Pam Rogers, 29 Gilman Street in Putnam, and she wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Amy Beck Turner of Clarksburg, Massachusetts, and she wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Eric Rosati of uh, 15 Luzon Ave in Dayville, and he wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Andrew Rocket of 20 Blue Ridge Mountain Drive in Summers wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Emma Gilbert, 22 Lincoln Road in Danielson, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Laura Monarski of 6 Caribou Drive in Norwich wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Donna Kutu, 21 Jacques Street in Danielson, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. <clears throat> Karen Klein, 416 Mountain, Mount Auburn Street in Cambridge, Mass., wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Josh Breyer, 4801 Pine Street in Philadelphia, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Matthew Costa, 6736 Anders Terrace, Springfield, Virginia, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. The next one is Matthew Coombs, Coombs 62 Jeffrey's Neck Road, Ipswich, Mass., wrote in support of the Latin program, maintaining that. The next one is, the next one is uh, Zane Cook of 6400 Mueller Boulevard, Austin, Texas, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Um, Nicholas Giade, 402 Little, Glen, Little Gem Court, Niceville, Florida, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Gabriel Weaver wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Alexander Gray wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Denise, uh, Dennis. Denise Walsh, um, 19 Maryland Street, Danielson, Connecticut, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Carolyn Lacerda, um, with an address in Belgium, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program.
I didn't. Matthew Costa submitted a second uh, public comment as well in support of the Latin program. Nita Vitaliano of 151 Cinder Brook Drive in Wethersfield wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Zach Damaris, 23 Peep Toad Road in Dayville, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Adam Barclay, 923 10th Street in Washington, D.C., wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Uh, Michael Weaver wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Solce Fonico of 1656 Westwood Ave, Atlanta, Georgia, wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Chris Havels of 3061 David Ave in Danielson wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Michaela Valetti of 216 West Broadway, Boston, Mass. Wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Sydney Zocella, 23 Hutchin Street, Danielson. Wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Greg McKay, uh, Dolores Circle in Putnam Center. Wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Sean O'Leary wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Sedona Pratt wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Lisa Prof Profetto wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. Caitlin Menger wrote in support of maintaining the Latin program. And that concludes all the written submitted public comment. Thank you. At this time, we'll open the floor for uh, public comment related to the Board of Education budget. Just a reminder, please state your name and address, and the floor is yours. Can you hear me from here? Or should I? Is this good? Okay. Um, Mary Beth Davis, 36 Port Upon Road, Sterling, Connecticut. But I also have land at 73 State Ave in Davo, where we're building a house. And no surprise, I'm here in support of maintaining the Latin program, but I wanted to tell you why. My husband and I are both 2009 graduates of Killingly High School. In 2021, my husband and I had the opportunity to purchase land in Killingly, and we jumped at the opportunity. The town we currently live in has not been known for having a very strong school district. So when we found land in Killingly, we're excited about the prospect of going back to our roots and sending our own children to Killingly schools. At first, my husband was not entirely convinced that sending our children to Killingly would be better than where we currently live. Uh, one of my talking points for this discussion was how KHS opened many doors for me beyond high school. And I owe this in large part to my Latin class and Mr. Dodge. After high school, I graduated from Gettysburg College and was accepted to Teach for America and I was a high school English teacher until 2021. I now support other teachers in getting their licensure, and I tutor teachers in licensure ex exams focused on grammar and writing. My love of education and my love of English stems from the days that I was taking Latin with Mr. Dodge. I learned more about the English language in Latin class than I did in my English class, and that doesn't mean that English teachers aren't helpful. I was an English teacher. Mr. Dodge was my English teacher. But that's just to say that Latin forced us to learn the specifics about grammar in a way that none of my English classes ever could. It was that foundation that made me passionate about writing and literacy that I brought with me to college and then to my own classroom. Beyond grammar though, Latin gave me a challenge that made me feel confident. I remember people asking me why I was learning a quote unquote dead language. And that's a good question. Why learn a language that isn't even spoken? Aside from learning grammar, the way Latin forces students to read improves reading comprehension. 
In addition, since Latin is the root of the English language and many others, it also improves students' vocabulary. In fact, according to an analysis done from the College Board in 2016, students who take Latin earn higher SAT scores on average than students who study other languages. While the national average for critical reading was a 494 and writing a 482 in 2016, students who took Latin received a 685 and a 682 respectively. Even math scores were 200 points higher. I think it goes without saying, but considering that SAT scores are a large component with college applications, the benefits of a Latin program are pretty clear. Part of the KHS mission statement includes that the KHS community strives to promote, quote, challenging learning opportunities that address individual needs and foster talents. Students will demonstrate intellectual growth and academic excellence, end quote. Removing a Latin program at KHS is antithetical to this mission statement. Even more so, the Killingly Public Schools mission lists, lists five different criteria that KPS will do to improve the quality of life and self-esteem of all students. One of these criteria include, quote, provide students with the necessary foundations for learning, specifically in the area of literacy, end quote. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, the reading proficiency at KHS is 55%, and the overall testing rank is in the bottom 50%. While the reading proficiency is 55, at 55 percent is higher than the Connecticut national average, it's or the Connecticut average, it's still 51 percent. Um, it's still 55 percent. And I'm not an English teacher. I mean, I'm an English teacher, not a math teacher, but I know 55 percent is failing. If the focus of KPS and KHS is to improve literacy, getting rid of a program that has been proven to do just that seems quite opposite, and it seems unaligned and reckless, given that our children's futures are at stake. To go back to the conversation I had with my husband, I argued to him that Killingly schools offered more variety, and I was right. The only other school to offer a Latin program in our county is Woodstock Academy. To compare, Woodstock's reading proficiency is 74%, and their overall testing rank is in the top 50%. Granted, Woodstock has more resources than our district, but why take away some of the resources that we have for our kids now? The final thing I want to note is the financial component of this debate, given that this is a budget meeting. First, I read the proposed 23-24 meeting before this meeting, and I noted the following. Quote, the BOE has estimated a reduction in tuition-based students for fiscal year 23-24. These revenues are based on the anticipated number of students enrolling from Brooklyn. Brooklyn has indicated a decrease in the number of students intending to enroll, end quote. This begs the question why. My husband, a 2009 KHS graduate, lived in Brooklyn. I asked him when I was writing this, why did you choose to go to Brooklyn? He said football, but it's also because there were more opportunities at Killing than, Killing than there were Woodstock. So why eliminate opportunities for students compared to a school that has more opportunities? It seems like we should be doing the exact opposite of that. Second, based on what I have read in the proposed budget, eliminating the Latin program eliminates Mr. Dodd's position. From what I have read, his salary is 44000 or 46000 It's hard to tell in here because I'm an English teacher, not a math teacher. Aside from the fact that that's a steal, given that Mr. Dodge's experience and expertise is literally out of this world, I can't help but notice that I had some other math thing here, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but I noticed that there's a, there were many times on the slides here where there was a, a budget surplus or there was a number that I just kept thinking, okay, but that could count as Mr. Dodge. Like, we could keep this program. Like, and I'm sure creating a budget is very challenging. S so I'm not... <laughs> I'm not trying to, to be confrontational. But in my position now, I am an administrator in the office, and I am a 0.5 FTE. So to see a central office assistant position at $100,000 is a lot when we could keep a phenomenal teacher and a phenomenal program at half that cost. Regardless, Choosing whether or not to keep a program based on saving money sends the message that the mission statement that KPS and KHS has is only important if we're able to save money. I do want to thank you for your time, and I hope you reconsider this budget proposed to eliminate a program that has shaped many generations, including mine, and I hope continues with my own children. An opportunity is exactly why I chose to buy land in Killingly, so please don't make me regret that decision. Mary Beth Davis, 36 Porter Pond Road. Thank you. Thank you.
David Knoyer, 21 Mountain View Landing, Danielson, Connecticut. Longtime resident, retired state trooper. Uh, now, hopefully fully retired. Um, as I look at these testimonials here uh, on Mr. Dodge, I, I'd really like to meet this guy. Who else has read this in its entirety? You have here doctors, uh, physicians, uh, college professors, you know, uh, writers, uh, retired military in Washington, D.C., saying what an impact this man had and Latin had on their lives. And just to be slightly profane, why in the hell are we even thinking of dumping this course? It has a positive impact on our school. Latin is the mother language. Without it, there's no foundation. If you throw away the foundation, your house will crumble. Um, I do not support dumping of this course. I support, you know, exploring ways to continue with it. You're telling us here you have a budget surplus and a lack of staff. This is a no-brainer. If you've got a budget surplus, keep the Latin. If you've got a lack of staff, keep this instructor. Uh, publicly, I think it would be an embarrassment to the Board of Ed and, and to the entire education in this school to just disregard Latin. I mean, the only Latin I learned was, was growing up and training part-time as an altar boy. <laughs> that, that's my only Latin. Now that I'm retired, maybe, uh, you know, if, if this guy does evening courses, I'd be interested. Um, you know, that, that's all I, all I have to say about this, and I'm kind of speaking from the heart. Uh, keep Latin, please. Thank you. Thank you. All set? Very good. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Laura Minarski, 6 Caribou Drive, Norwich, Connecticut. I am also here in support of the KHS Latin program. I graduated from Killingo High School Vocational Agriculture in 2002. I am a former Latin student of Ernest Dodge. I understand that this budget isn't finalized, but it may include the cutting of the Latin program. I am distressed that this would end such a unique and substantial experience for current and future students. The Latin program was one of the most influential and rewarding classroom experiences I have had in my entire academic career. Mr. Dodge's classes were not just about learning a foreign language, they were a haven, a stark contrast from the chaos that was going on in my home at the time. His classroom offered what I needed to succeed during the most crucial years of my life. Courses were highly structured, assignments were challenging, but he was always willing to work with students that wanted to improve. I truly felt supported and was able to develop a sense of accomplishment that motivated me to complete high school and go on to be a first-generation college student, and graduate with a bachelor's degree in pathobiology from UConn Stores. Mr. Dodge's classroom instruction taught me how to approach learning in a systematic way, to break, break things down in a simp into simpler elements, and by remaining diligent and persistent, I could use this process to navigate my way through a variety of complex problems. I continue to use this process in my career as an R&D investigative scientist at Pfizer in Groton. In closing, I would like to say that Latin is more than just a classical language. Although it does assist me greatly with English, scientific, and medical language, it is far more than that. Mr. Dodge's Latin program was a holistic culmination of experiences that illuminated my troubled high school years and continues to positively influence my life as an adult and parent. I have a 14-year-old son, and although he is lucky enough to enroll in Latin at NFA, I am still envious of Killingly residents who have this honor of placing their kids in Mr. Dodge's class. I am truly grateful and proud to have been part of the Killingly High School Latin program. Thank you. Thank you. Ian McDonald, uh, 548 Valley Road, uh, Davil. 
Uh, so, you know, I'm sympathetic to everybody. It, creating a broad budget isn't easy, as, as Mike was saying, and, and uh, it's inevitable that you look at something and say, well, why are we spending it there? And then, you know, sometimes upon further uh, reevaluation, um, I'll just say, you know, uh, we've had several, a lot of programs that are kind of unique to Killingly that are particularly strong programs in Killingly. Uh, we've had the, you know, the VOAG, just to name a few, we have the VOAG program and the business program. Um, some of our athletic programs, be it, you know, football or wrestling, um, our music program. Uh, and, and another one is the Latin program. And, and these all uh, have in the past and, and mostly still have kind of distinguished Killingly uh, as exceptional in, in these areas. And um, I think when we have, and, and, and all these programs in different ways have been springboards uh, for students uh, to, to really succeed. And what is going to be a springboard for one student is not necessarily gonna be the same thing as for another student. And at different times, some of them may have struggled with enrollment and some of them have done better. And this has waxed and waned, but I think most people who have gone through these programs really, uh, very much value them, and, and the Latin program, as you've heard, is is very much in that category. Uh, I'll just say, you know, in terms of enrollment, you know, my cousin uh, teaches at the masonry program over at Ellis Tech, and that's, I think, generally uh, considered one of the best uh, programs in the state in terms of what actual uh, uh, employers are looking for uh, from their students and their, their satisfaction. And they just won a national championship in terms of masonry last year. They've had struggles with enrollment, but it's a particularly strong program. So my understanding is that the Latin program has kind of recovered in terms of any enrollment issues and, and has, has an excellent enrollment for the following year. So I understand why somebody might look at that and say, you know, we had a little dip here, but uh, that when you have an, an excellent proven teacher who also has come in and pinch hit and helped out the district in English classes when we haven't had them. I, he helped recently in a... AP class, it's, it's not easy to find good advanced placement teachers off the shelf, and, and he was able to come in and really help the district in that respect. So I'll just say, you know, I'm not gonna list them, but as we look at these goals here, be it ad academic, oh, I guess I am listing them. <laughs> academic achievement, uh, retaining highly effective professionals. Um, I, don't, I don't know as much about organizational systems here, but school culture and climate, pursuer of knowledge, effective communicator, personally responsible, critical thinker. Again, I don't know about technologically fluent because I, I haven't you know, been around it for a while, but this fits all of those things. I mean, and you know, we talked earlier about attracting uh, students from Brooklyn and, and the impact that has on our budget. Killingly, I think often unfairly, maybe gets kind of less respect for their academics and I think Sometimes this, this really has been unfair, but Latin is one of those things that very much this strong program has d distinguished us, and as we're looking to attract <laughs> students to the district, I, I think that's the wrong direction to go to, to not be having that. As was mentioned with SAT scores, that's, that's a very important thing. That's for anybody who's applying to college. Now, I don't particularly care that much about SAT scores or think SATs or think they're the most important thing in the world, but colleges do and anybody who wants the opportunity to attend schools, that's an important <laughs> aspect. And, and also just having Latin on your application. This is something, when colleges are looking at applications, they're looking at you know, a big stack of applications, and a lot of these folks might have good grades or similar grades. This is something that's gonna pop that, and is gonna show this is a student that's really committed and capable <laughs> of handling challenging work. And I, I think it's an important op opportunity. You know, lastly, I'll just say, in terms of Latin, it's a dead language, it's something we used to study. I think if you talk to a lawyer, <laughs> they might have a very different opinion of that because they need to use it often. Even somebody who's not a lawyer but has to deal with contracts often, they're gonna see a lot of Latin. In medicine, you're gonna see a lot of Latin. In physiology, even sports science, things like that. You know, the sciences, be it uh, you know, chemistry, physics, and especially biology, there's a tremendous amount of memorization of Latin terms involved there. Religious studies, my wife went to divinity school, 
And the students who had a background in Latin very much had a leg up, whether they're looking at, you know, different bi biblical texts, or certainly if they're a Catholic, it's, it's very critical for the, those folks as well. You know, I, I mean, you could go on and on. I mean, you know, history, classics, really anywhere, anywhere in academia, you're likely to find a good amount of Latin. So this, this is a tremendous program. As everybody has said, there's a tremendous teacher, and I think we're very fortunate to have it, and I hope, uh, I understand, you know, we have to reassess things, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody on that, but I hope we can kind of take this all in and, and just look back at it and, and try to reassess and make sure this program stays at Killingly. Thank you. Uh, Eric Rosati, 15, Luzon Ave, Dayville. Um, I've been a Killingly resident for 18 years, started at KMS, uh, graduated KHS in 2015. Um, I had Mr. Dodge in AP English 4. I didn't have him in Latin. Uh, my brother Brandon had him in Latin. Um, but I don't need to have Mr. Dodge in Latin to know uh, the impact he had and does have on the students past and present here. Um, I won't read the email I wrote. I know that's on record, but I do have a few other things I'd like to say. Um, after he hearing all of the comments submitted in support of the Latin program, uh, I think it just goes to show the impact the Latin program and Mr. Dodge has had on the Killingly community and the students that have gone here. Uh, generations of students have been positively impacted by the program. Uh, the outpouring of support uh, for the program from the public comment, et cetera, um, from people speaking tonight uh, is touching. Um, it reminds me of a scene from uh, one of my favorite movies um, as a teacher, Mr. Holland's Opus with uh, Richard Dreyfuss. Um, at the end of the movie, he retires. They cut the band program, um, and they uh, fill the auditorium full of students past and present who he had impacted. Um, I think reading those public comments, seeing people from California, Louisiana, wherever else it may be, um, doctors, lawyers. Um, I became a teacher, but... Um, his teaching certainly had a tremendous impact on me. Um, I just think it goes to show we could fill that same auditorium for uh, Mr. Dodge. Um, I know we are not taking action on any items tonight, uh, but I just wanted to reiterate the importance of maintaining this program. Um, it will help us stay competitive in terms of course offerings with other districts uh, and continue to help our students experience great academic success in and beyond um, high school. Um, I know after I had his uh, AP English 4 course, I never struggled on an essay again in college. Always got an A. Um, that was because of him um, and the, the teaching that he provided. I know he does the same for his Latin students. Um, the Latin program is a tremendous asset to students in the Killingly School District. And uh, thank you to those who responded to my email, or if you saw my email, thank you for reading it. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any more additional comments on the Board of Education budget? Ernest Dodge, Latin teacher for uh, 41 years here at Killingley. I'm at uh, 229 Liberty Highway, Putnam, Connecticut. I may cry because I've listened to some amazing comments that really I, you have touched me. Thank you. I want to express again that I'm fully dedicated to serving Killingly Public Schools into the future in my capacity as a faculty member and for the entire Latin program as I have since 1982. I have no plans or desire to retire. My position as a teacher at Killingly High School is the work to which I am seriously committed. I'm part of the greater Killingly community, and I have, as my fellow faculty and Killingly administration through the years are aware, always placed the academic excellence and success of my students first among all of interests as an educator. My dedication has never been about my ego or career ambition, but about the talented 
dedicated and intelligent students to represent the quality of education in Killingly Public Schools. It is for this reason that I came back to teach the Latin program after originally retiring, big mistake, 10 years ago. I realized that I missed my work and role as a teacher. And at the behest of parents, students, and a former board member specifically, I returned happily to Killingly High School. I'm generous with my time, often staying after school multiple days a week throughout my career to tutor students, teach supplemental courses, such as pre-Socratic philosophy, to one of the students who wrote a letter for me, um, ancient Greek, which I'm doing currently with a sophomore that I'm teaching, and I'm serving as a faculty advisor for other things, and I'm on committees, and I do things, and I do extra stuff. I pretty much will do anything anybody asks me to do. I've never denied anybody. Last year, I took over the AP English course, and uh, I did this starting in November um, without any advance notice, but the principal said, would you be willing to take it on? I know it's a big responsibility. Will you be willing to do it? And I said, yeah, gladly. I would love to do it because I so enjoy teaching English. So I did, and it was a great experience. It was a lot of work, but it was a great experience. Um, I've been appreciative all these years for what I've learned from my fellow faculty and from administration. Lastly, I can count three current um, Killingly High School department heads that are former students of mine. Um, Mrs. Gutierrez, Ms. Carver, and Mr. O'Leary, as well as the current faculty, Mr. Rosati and Mr. Rahab, as my former students and now friends. These faculty directly lead and innovate the Killingly system, and I'd like to think that their study of Latin and English contributed to their success as students, thinkers, and educators. Their presence among us is a testament to the ethos of giving back to community that exists in Killingly and the Northeast Connecticut region. This is to say that my ethos and dedication to the students and system of Killingly Public Schools is true, long-term, and committed to excellence. I have to say, when I look at the Killingly Public Schools profile of a graduate, it's written for me. This is exactly what I do. It's exactly what I believe in and strive to do every day. That excellence directly serves my students, and I feel that possibility of eliminating the entire Latin Studies program at Killingly because of a misplaced budget cut would be a great disservice to current and future Killingly students. I know that many students achieve success by studying Latin along with other major subjects in which they hope to uh, take, hope to study or concentrate on college. And to exemplify this, I've had two seniors this year. One, our current valedictorian, who will major in classics and pre-med, and has been accepted at early decision at Brown University. His brother, two years ago, another student of mine, is currently a student at Brown University studying pre-med and still continuing his Latin courses. Killingly stands out for having a Latin studies program that ties students to the history of our Western civilization as compared to any, many schools in this area which haven't been able to keep Latin in, in their program. It's hard to believe that it's come down to Woodstock Academy and Farnford School. I know that many students achieve success by studying Latin along with other major subjects in which they hope to major in college. Um, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. All of my current students who plan to continue, plan to continue their Latin study next year I have no idea who's going to be coming into the first year. But I do know that I have talked to quite a number of parents and students from other towns that are interested, very interested. And I do know that students coming into VOAG 
are very interested in Latin, and rightfully so, directly committed to what they'll be studying. Uh, I can easily list the names of, of hundreds of students who've studied Latin that directly supported this, and I, that directly supported their success in current careers. Christian Sarantovlis, a lawyer in town, graduated from Yale, and he says, it's because of Latin and working with me that he went to Yale. Megan Wade, who is a lawyer in Hartford right now. Kathleen Barboza, another Connecticut lawyer, graduate of, of um, in classics at um, Connecticut I have Latin students who have studied and majored in pre-law in classics in college, Yale University, Boston University, Connecticut College, respectively. Latin is a subject that directly supports the success and co-study of other major subjects like pre-med, pre-law, English, religion, education. And I can list the names of countless former, former English students who study at Killingly directly contributed to their career success as well. This is a success, this success is an experience that all dedicated teachers have. Nevertheless, these students speak for the relevance and necessity of Latin in Killingly. My former students are members of our greater community at Killingly in Connecticut and throughout the United States individuals who make this country what it is today. I have done my part to give back to the community, and I wish to continue to do this work. I also would like to read you a letter that I received from Andrew Rockett, who was principal at Killingly High School in recent years. He was here for, I believe, four or five years. Um, dear members of the Killingly Town Council and Board of Ed, as a former principal of Killingly High School, I'm writing to express my strong and continued support for the Latin program. During my tenure, I witnessed firsthand the benefits that this program brought to KHS students and the town of Killingly. While Latin may be perceived as a challenging language to learn, I firmly believe that it is an essential component of a well-rounded education for all students, including those who may be struggling academically. The study of Latin promotes critical thinking and analysis skills, as well as a deeper understanding of history and culture, and it can inspire intellectual curiosity in even the most disengaged students. Interesting, as our current thrust in the system is cognitive engagement. I've seen firsthand, um, okay, as educators, is it our responsibility to provide all students with the tools and resources they need to succeed? And I believe that the Latin program at KHS is an important part of that effort. The dedicated teacher of the Latin program, Mr. Dodge, works tirelessly to provide students with resources and support they need to excel in the program. And he understands the value of meeting students where they are and helping them to reach their full potential. I have seen firsthand the positive impact that the Latin program has had on students of all abilities. For some, it has helped to reinforce their strengths and academic interests, while for others, it has provided a new and aspirational challenge that has helped to motivate and inspire them. I strongly support the Latin program at KHS. It is valuable and essential part of KHS's academic curriculum and it provides students with valuable skills and knowledge that will serve them well in their future studies and careers. I urge you to continue to support and promote this program as it is an important part of KHS's commitment to academic excellence for all students. Very truly yours, Andrew K. Rocket. As a Killingly taxpayer, I would like to ask that the Town Council request the Board of Ed by vote to put $45,000 back into their budget to maintain the Latin program. 
I'm sorry, at this meeting here, it's just for public. It's uh, just a presentation. It's our annual meeting on, I think, May 1st. It's when we can have uh, motions from the floor to change items. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other public comments on the Board of Education budget? Michael Yuko, 20 John Street, Danielson, Connecticut. Uh, I am a proud graduate of Kinley High School. Uh, probably long before a lot of people in this room were even on the face of the earth, so it's been a while. So uh, you got a tough, you know, you've been elected to make the tough decisions, and one of the tough decisions going to be, what do you do with this budget? We do have veterans senior citizens and handicapped people in the town of Kilnley that may not be able to afford this increase. So there's certain items that may be cut. By the sounds of it, Latin shouldn't be one of it. I didn't take Latin, so maybe it shouldn't be. Uh, one of the things I do not want to see is the security offices, the armed security offices even touch. I want, I would, you know, would like to see that stay, that has to stay. If someone thinks that that can't happen here, they are mistaken. It can happen anywhere and we gotta protect our kids. They are the future. Uh, one of the line items I saw on the board was that uh, there is a business assistant for $100,000. That's a good chunk of change. I'm would like the Board of Education to maybe discuss or form a committee to look into the $94,000 grant that we're leaving on the board. The $100,000, we would have to put in $6,000. We're leaving money out there. I have heard on the street, people have approached me saying, yes, you can't guarantee you get the grant every year, and it's only $94,000. Only $94,000, I tell them, give me that. The other thing is, yes, you can't guarantee that the grant will come every year, but look at the source that the grant's coming from. I don't know if they're really going to go anywhere in the state of Connecticut. I think they're here to stay. They're building up quite a bit. So I would like the Board of Education to maybe form a committee, discuss Let's talk to the taxpayers, let's talk to the kids, Let, you know, let's get it on the board. We can discuss it like adults, what we, if we can maybe come to an agreement on the $94,000. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on the Board of Education budget? Does anybody else want to make any comments on the public, for the Board of Education budget? Last call for public comment on the Board of Education budget. Uh, next item on the agenda is a, adjournment. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion made by Mr. Grandowski. Second. Seconded by Mrs. George. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Meeting is adjourned.